In order to live an extraordinary and abundant life, you must focus on your internal battle and win within. My name is Randy Wilson, and welcome to the Rich Mind Podcast. All right, everyone, welcome back to the Rich Mind Podcast. And today, coming back with another fantastic guest, super excited about the conversation we're about ready to have with Tom Dardick. We were just having a conversation before we hit record, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, the He's a fellow podcaster. He's got a lot of passion for helping people in terms of figuring out the internal dialogues and things that are going on within to help them bridge and have a better life in their outside 3D world. It's just going to be a ton of fun. So a little bit about Tom before we get started. Tom is a, a musician and an author. I didn't, we didn't talk about the, I see there's a guitar in your background. I can see that there's now. A, there's guitars, there's a drum kit back there. Fantastic. <laughs> PA system, yep. That's awesome. So he's a, he's a musician. Maybe we'll talk a little bit about that. He's also an author. He's an expert in the field of interpersonal communication. He's a bachelor's from Tufts University in economics and is certified in a wide range of psychometric tools. He's the founder and CEO of Eye of Power, LLC, where Eye of Power is a personal and professional development system designed to help people and organizations thrive and survive, which is fantastic. As I mentioned, he's a fellow podcaster. His podcast is called Eye of Power, which goes along with his brand and his company and everything like that. We were having a conversation. He's just uh, just recently passed through the 100 episode mark, which I just passed the, about 150 episodes for myself. Maybe we'll get into a little bit about how that's been for us, our experiences, and maybe give you a little bit of encouragement for you out there listening to see if maybe you might be able to get your podcast started as well. We're not sure exactly where this conversation is going to go, but we're <laughs> sure that it's going to be a lot of fun. So Tom, welcome to the show, man. Thank you, Randy. Appreciate it so much. Yeah, this is going to be great. So I went through a few of the high level bullet point lists there. We talked about it, you being a musician, you showed me all your equipment in the background, which is super <laughs> cool. Appreciate you doing that. But take a few minutes and just start with wherever you'd like. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Go as deep and as wide as you'd like with your story. But yeah, to let us know a little bit more about yourself. Well, uh, music has actually been a, a thread throughout my entire life. Um, I've never made it my full-time profession but it's always been a part of my life and has actually impacted some of the choices I've made professionally. Um, but what I'd say has been the thread that has kind of sewn the picture together is I'm really a lifelong student of the human condition. It started as basically as far back as I can remember when I could soon after I could read, I got into reading mythology Greek and Roman myths, Norse myths, things like that. And I don't know why I like the stories. You know, when you're when you're five, six, seven, eight years old, it's not like you're seeing the big picture of the uh, of what it is to to be human. Um, and I wasn't like that at all either. But but I I never stopped wondering about what it's all for. You know, why things are the way they are. What matters more than what. Um, why people suffer, how do we move towards less of that, those sorts of questions. And it's never gone away. I, I think about it, that kind of thing, nearly constantly. And uh, it's really been a full-time professional effort um, over the past 20 some odd years at when I started getting into teaching interpersonal communication skills. And when I was doing that, I learned that the how we do things, because we were actually learning techniques of how to connect with people and and communicate more effectively. And through those years, I gravitated away from the how and to the why. And since 2011, my practice has been connecting people and organizations uh, more closely to purpose. And Purpose is kind of a funny thing. I, 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 as I've gone through life, I've tried to find purpose. And what I'm talking about with you right now, Randy, is what I would say is close to the middle of the bullseye for me as to what my purpose is. Um, you know, if somebody would ask me one word, I'd say it's to hold a candle or hold that torch or, or light, light the environment around us. That's sort of the role I try to, to play in life. And um, what is it, though? What, when you think about it, so, again, some people think it's it's a mirage, that it's meaningless, that it's a, a game that we play. Um, others 
find that, or they might even have things they tell themselves that they're, they're not purpose. They don't have a purpose or their, their life is meaningless. And, um, I couldn't, I, I, I don't think there's anything that's further from the truth than that. I think the truth is that everything is exists for a reason, even the things we don't like. And the more we dial into that greater, I don't know of a better word than reality, the more we increase our agency, our power. We started to talk a little bit earlier about agency, um, but the more we, the closer our model or the way that we navigate through the world is to what's real and true beyond ourselves, the more personal power we have. And what I mean by that is the ability to make things happen that we'd like to make happen. And that starts from within. Is that what I'm hearing you say as far as the internal <laughs> battles, the internal issues and all that kind of thing? Is that where it all stems from? Um, I can't say yes, a hundred percent to that. Yes. In a way, no, in a way, um, yes, in a way, in the sense that nobody is in your head, but you, nobody's lived the life that you've lived, but you, no one's walked in your shoes, but you, nobody has the unique set of goodies in terms of characteristics, abilities, perceptions, experiences, um, but you, and so our gifts and our, our purpose comes from that individuality. But it, but it's not complete because it has no meaning outside of how it serves other people. So really, it's it, 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 where we are. It's a it's a paradox. We're individuals, but the individuality only matters so much. It really it, that only matters in the context of how we're connected to other people and how we really help them. And so it's kind of a beautiful thing if you think about it. We're, we're beings of limited perceptive power. We don't know ourselves that well. We don't know other people that well. We're, we're kind of wandering around in the dark a little bit. And we need each other to see those things that we can't see ourselves. So this is, I mean, this is the very thing that, that I'm most passionate about now is, is helping people see this, grasp hold of it, and move in the direction, whatever that means to them, of, of greater agency through greater connection. So we've said the word twice, and I, I told you from the beginning, it was going to be a big piece of what I think we talked yeah. about. So you've said agency, the word agency. I would love for you to go a little deeper and just unpack what that means to you. So if someone's hearing that word for the first time, uh, I think you hear it maybe in general terms and, and uh, you'll hear agents or anyways, you'll hear it in different formats or different words, sure. meanings, right? Just curious on with what you're describing today. What does agency actually mean in the context of purpose and, and people's you know, fulfillment? And that's really what it is. It's, it's the ability to, to make something happen that you want to have happen. So it, it is, it, it's, you could think of it as a, a, a force of will or it's very related, I think, to free will. Again, some people believe that there's no such thing, that, that it's an illusionary thing, that we don't really have free will, that we're really we're complicated computer programs or, you know, something a little bit, maybe perhaps more than that, but not much more than that. And, um, and I don't know whether that's true or not, but I tend to not think that that's true. I tend towards the idea of embracing that idea of agency, which just, agency simply means I can think about something and then take actions that cause it to happen. And so I, I have the ability, I call, it's personal power. It's the ability to be a force in the world rather than passive, right? The opposite of it would be, I have no control over anything. The, the world happens to me and I can adjust my attitude towards that, what happens to me. Um, so maybe that's a little, that might be the extent of my power, let's just say. And there's reason to think that too. I don't prescribe to that myself. I, I think we're more, I think we're way more powerful than we think we are. And also I think we're very blind to the effects we have in the world. We, a, a smile, a kind word that can be, a, that can literally be life or death difference for people. And so these little tiny things end up in, you know, they're not tiny times all the things that we do in our, our day and our weeks and our months and our years. So you mentioned at the very beginning, the human condition, that's kind of been a study of yours since you were 
little is what I heard you say really, from the right? beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. From the beginning and the suffering and all the different things that, you know, that come along with the human condition. You're from what I'm hearing, you're saying it kind of comes along with this agency of the decision of having control over the little things, right? Yeah. Taking control well, of your own personal self, right? Versus it being in control of the outside environment, the, the 3D world, I guess, or however you want to, whatever the best way of phrasing it for yourself, whatever you think. Yeah, is that's. Best. The, I know that's the term that you, you that you use for for to talk about that same that same type of type of mat, manifestation, right? The the 3D world. Yes, although when you use the word control, Randy, that's another trap kind of a thing that we can fall into, where we have to be careful about what we think we can control, what we can't control. I, I think we have control over um, what we think and what we do. I, I, I believe that's where our control is. I don't think we have much more control than that. I think that's about it. And we can control what we think and we control what we do. Can't really control what other people think and do. And a lot of things in the world, we have very little ability to, to make much difference. What, but, but, in those things about ourselves that we can control, it ties back into what we were talking about earlier with we're individuals, but we're connected. Um, it's through those, those connections and through those effects that we have in the people around us that are for, force multipliers that we can have effects in the world, even in things that are beyond our control. So it's, so in other words, it's enough to focus our energy on what's in here and what, what we do, uh, th that's plenty for anybody. <laughs> so we don't need to worry about what other people do and don't do so much. So is that what you prescribe to your clients? And then what you try to do for yourself is to, yeah, is, is that? It's one of the yeah. things, sure. Okay. Um, what, when I'm working with people through the eye of power model, what, what it, how that works is it's a, it's a look through the lenses. So that the eye of power model is made of four quadrants and it's four layers in each quadrant. So that leaves sort of 16 pieces of the pie. And each one represents a, uh, I, I, use, I use the word lens because it's a way of looking at, at things. It's, a, it's like a map. And so it's a map of, of, our, of our power, of, of what we can do and what we can't do. And the layers in the model Two of the layers are the things that hold us back from making a positive change. Two of them are empowering that move us forward. So we're looking through these lenses. We're looking at the things that hold us back and we're looking at the things that move us forward. And so we look at that. We look through the lens and we say, okay, how does this apply to this aspect of my life right now? And then we translate into that into small. I, well, I don't, they may not be small. They're incremental sustained actions. I call them sustained incremental actions, SIAs. And, and so, and you don't do it by yourself. You're working with somebody else. So you're helping somebody and somebody else is helping you take, make the, look through these lenses and apply SIAs or SIAs, uh, sustained incremental actions over a period of time. And that's really the best way I know to change our you know, changed our behaviors in a deep way that, that, that sustain. So is it changing? So am I hearing habits, basically habits, or is it yes. deeper than that even? Um, it's habits plus habit. Habits hmm. are interesting. Hab habits are wonderful servants and terrible masters, right? So, so we want to be, when, when we're going to increase our agency, increase our personal power, the more that our habits serve us, and the less we serve them, the greater our agency is. So is this geared towards individuals? It sounds like it's individuals. Or is it more organizational type or is it both? The model, yeah. The, the model right now is in organizations. Uh, when I first developed the model a few years ago, I was thinking in terms of a membership base that was open to the general population, which I am going to do that, but I'm not starting there. I'm starting with organizations with teams because then they have, um, as I just described to you, you're not doing it by yourself. You're doing it with guides. So I needed to build an ecosystem of people that are using it before I could sort of launch it to the public. And the truth be told, economically speaking, it's a, it's a better business plan to work with a team than it is to try to build a, a general populist membership models, a, a much harder and longer road. So from a 
from a business uh, strategy perspective, I, I had to do it this way. Makes sense. So if there's an organization out there that is, uh, what is it that they're, are they struggling with communications? Or are they struggling with, with results? Or are they struggling with, what are they struggling with as far as when they come to the I've power model that's going to help them implement, obviously, the, the processes that you're mentioning to gain these better results? What is it that these, these companies are kind of missing, the keys that they're missing that your I have power kind of plugs it in for them? That's a phenomenal question. The the needs I see in the world right now, and they're they're getting more and more chronic and more and more uh, acute. Is um, I, and the the direct answer to your question, Randy, is culture. So if you want to move towards a culture of greater trust and respect, this is a way to help leaders move their culture in that direction. So what's culture? Culture is the set of expectations as to what's okay around here. Right. It's it's what's accepted around here. What's the standards by which we we operate and us humans tend to have some habits that are, aren't really good for culture. We tend to want to if somebody does something we don't like, we'll tend to want to say that guy's a jerk and we're not going to say it to them all the time. We're going to say it to somebody else or if somebody does something we don't like rather than directly. Uh, say, hey, I don't like that, you might just not help them next time. Or, you know, these little tiny erosions of trust and respect. That, and, and if you look at organizations in the world, would you say the bar is super high? Because, you know, most organizations have a lot of room for improvement, right? And because people are people and, and, we're tasked with a to-do list that's longer than the than the day has hours. So everybody's under a certain amount of pressure in that way. We have a paradigm that says, if I don't get my to-do list done, there's something wrong with me. Or I'll be judged or I'll be rejected or somebody else is better than me. Or we got all this noise. And this is not good for mutual trust and respect. It's it, in order to, in order to build a, a healthy organization. Yes, we have to admit, make it based on merit, but we have to do it in a way that allows people to make mistakes and allows people to use their talents and use their gifts. And so, so that requires space is the word I use, Randy. It's, it, 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 you have to, the, 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 the leaders have to realize what's more important than what, and it's hard in the, in the struggle of the day to day meeting budgets or uh, meeting quotas or whatever the, tricks or currencies of, of the organization have to, happen to be. It's difficult to keep tethered to that people-centric view. But in a remote work, hybrid work, AI coming into play more and more, automation world, the, the currencies that bind humans together are becoming more and more important. I heard somebody very wise a few weeks ago say to me, currencies that are going to matter in the future are no longer dollars and transactions. It's going to be wisdom and creativity. And, mm -hmm. and that really struck a nerve with me. It's like, okay, so if we're going to work together, how are we going to get wiser and more creative? That might be a really good lens for people to think about. And so if you have a team, if you have a company, if you, ha if you have a, a, a department, how are you going to get more wisdom and creativity out of the people that you can influence in this way? That's my question. That's a great question. And that's so the the question or the word that's coming to my mind is collaboration. Is, is that a big piece? Or, I mean, that's kind of what I'm hearing you say that from the top down, it needs to be a collaboration from all levels within the organization, not anywhere from the top up or bottom up, bottom up or top down, right? Is, is, is yeah, collaboration I, a piece of that? Yeah, of course. Collaboration is the is a modality of, of of working, right? And it's an attitude. But it starts, I think, with a vision as to what it is that matters around here, right? What it, what's the most important thing around here? And the default in the world to date has been transactional, right? It's it's the it's it's the equation. You have this skill; it's worth this much money. I give you your paycheck. Shut up and do your job. Or the customer is going to pay this much for this thing that we do, and that's what it's going to be. So we need to do 200,000 of them this year. And 
these are the lenses that we're looking through. And there's nothing, I'm not, I'm not rejecting those. I'm saying that if those are the top and only lens you're looking through, you're going to have a difficult time building the highest culture and it's going to get harder and harder as time goes on. That's what I'm saying. So you mentioned different lenses. What would be maybe more preferred lenses to look at to get the better result that you're looking for uh, through the programs and things that you're mentioning? Is that if- one of my clients had a, a, a vision for his company that I thought was fantastic. He said, I want, and, and, and he was in, um, his company was a, a, a very successful auto body of uh, kind of not, not really what you'd call a sophisticated high level business where you've got lots of IT departments and, and worldwide uh, network. It wasn't like that. It was local and it was sort of blue collar, but his vision for his business was, I want this to be a place where people can come stay and have a good life. And that's darn good. I think that works very, very well. Where people can come, stay, and have a really good life. Um, that's a pretty good, it doesn't have to be universal, but that's that's not too far from the middle of the bullseye, I'd say. Uh, it's not everybody. See, th- that's the th- that's one of the other things is we think that if somebody comes on, it's a disaster if they move on. No, I don't think that's true. I, I think we're looking for the proper fits. You know, talent is about fit. The the, the example there is um, people use famously as um, getting stale now is Michael Jordan, right? When Michael Jordan was a basketball player, he's the most talented person in the world. Then he went and tried to play baseball. Not so much the same thing, right? Now, that doesn't make him less of an athlete, doesn't make him less coordinated, doesn't make him less of a person, just obviously not the same skill set of skills in the same circumstances. So that's part of the leadership equation too. So it's not that it, it's not that you're a home for everybody forever. It's that you want to be in the business of finding the talent, meaning the fits are right, cultivating those and being in the in the in the growth and development evolutionary business that that wisdom and creativity side of the equation you want that you want you want to be evolving because the world's evolving whether you want to or not it's happening fast so yeah, real you mentioned, fast yeah real well, it's fast getting so less and less optional with that said you mentioned earlier about the you know the advent of, of ai and how that's impacting culture and companies and just everything in general Discuss that a little bit. How is that impacting with some of these corporations and how they're having to pivot or change or, you know, just a culture within themselves? I hear different things, but I'm curious if someone with, with direct access to these companies, I'm curious what your thoughts are with, with AI and how it's going to impact the world moving forward. Well, I have a number of thoughts on that. I, I did a six-month AI mastery course, most of which is obsolete, and I just did it last year. So, <laughs> so. So it's kind of a fun topic. But having said that, there's two basic sort of polarities involved here. One is that as AI gets more and more capable, the bar in terms of what we have to do as a human to contribute in an economically feasible way is moving, right? If something can be automated, it's only a matter of time until it is automated because it's the, the scale is 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 crazily uh, uh, effective. Matter of fact, when I was in that course, what uh, some of the people there were saying that it's not going to be long before there's a billion dollar a year company with three people in it. Wow. That's going to happen pretty soon. And they also said that in the next four to five years will be as much social change as in the previous century. Hmm. So, so one of my podcast episodes was, I was thinking about that. I'm like, what does that mean? So I looked back a century back, what was life then? And it was not even close to what it is now. So, so to have that much change happen that fast is going to be a tremendous strain on, on our cultures, on, on our business decisions, on the structures of society. Everything is good. There's going to be a lot of pain um, related to all that sort of bottom end aspect of things that people are afraid of, concerned with. Now, the other side of that coin is how much it can be a force multiplier. So they were also saying that they expect to be 40% more efficient. So in other words, you could get a full week's worth of 
work done in three days. And so you're starting to see that happen, right? Where you can, where tasks take less time, you can just assign it to the digital assistant, whether it's a communication, a, a, a piece of writing, a, whatever it might be. If it's not a creative thing, if it's something that's more routine, something that's more transactional, you don't have to be spending half a day crafting this speech or this whatever it might be. You can be much more effective and efficient that way. And this is only going to get more and more uh, move in this direction. So that means that uh, each person is going to be that much more uh, productive and amplified. So we're going to be like, you know, 1.5 workers or two, two workers, something like that, each person. And if you don't get on the train, that's going to be tough. That's going to be a tough story. So I don't think it's optional. I don't either. And it sounds like you're a little bit more up to speed on everything that's going on even more so than me. I try, I'm trying to stay on top of it as much as I can through just self-education, just trying to read up on it. I'm playing around with the tools that I'm familiar with as much as I possibly can just to get aware of it. Uh, yeah, because I feel that some people might be pushing back a little bit too hard on it to the point where they're going to get left behind in the world the way it's going to be versus what they think is currently is. Do you have that same feeling or do you have any, any difference I, yes, with that? I, I, Yes, I think there's danger. Whenever something's new, you have that novelty, right? So, so there's, there's hype. There's, right now, there's people pu um, publishing books that they didn't write at all, right? People are putting out, you can see the videos. You know what they are, right? Where the, you have that voice that makes no sense on, these, on this video, and they're putting these videos out on YouTube or TikTok or whatever. They never touched a thing. It's just a, it's just a bot that's doing it. And so, and some people are monetizing it. I don't know. Maybe there's some people getting rich on it. I have no idea. But it's those kind of videos don't have, I'd call, lasting uh, value, right? They're, 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 they're aggregators at best. Whereas us humans, there's something a little bit more, you know, that soul to soul connection. So that'll be a phase that we go through and uh, people will become more and more discerning about things. Still, AI as a tool is a force multiplier because our brains are not good at remembering 10,000 things to think about in this one thing. And, and to be able to have something that does that for us is fantastic. So, um, and it, and it will impact and is impacting our ability to be clear, concise, insightful, uh, complete, respectful, uh, compliant, um, all kinds of things where we otherwise struggle. So where does that tie back into your mentioning earlier about the wisdom and connect or wisdom and uh, I'm drawing the last word creativity. So creativity. Yeah. So yeah. it's like, how does that going to impact the hierarchy of different organizations? Right. Because without the wisdom and creativity, AI is, I don't want to say it's useless, but at the same time, the tool is just a different animal. It's not necessarily as, it's only as good as the inputs from what I'm understanding, from what I've been able to use it for. Right. So without that wisdom and creativity, it's really doesn't have as much power uh, that it could have, right? Is that, is that right. what I'm saying? Absolutely. And I, it's, it's funny because I, for many years, my definition of wisdom came from uh, basically from, from playing Dungeons and Dragons where you had attributes that you'd roll up for your characters and one was intelligence and one was wisdom. And intelligence was for the magic users because it was very complicated to put together the spells and you had to remember all this stuff and you had to have sort of the, the raw data that we that we uh, data processing that we associate with high IQ and we call that intelligence. And then in the game you'd call wisdom would be for the clerics. So that would be the people, uh, uh, the characters that clerics are like priests, like people of faith and they're faithful to whatever their, their God happens to be in the game. It could be any God. It wasn't a, you know, it wasn't a, a real world thing. It could be anything. And so wisdom, I always thought of, I thought of as intelligence as knowledge and wisdom as more like discipline and control of, of your, of your deeds. And that served me for a while, but recently I got what I think is maybe a little bit more refinement on the, on the distinction there. Intelligence is knowledge about that which changes and wisdom is, is knowledge about that which doesn't change. 
I thought that was pretty good. I have not heard it. That, yeah, that that is good. I need to sit with that. Say that yeah, one more me, time. I had please. to too. Yeah. Yeah. Sit with that one more. Yeah. Would you say that one more time? Just so that way I can yeah, even hear intel- that my own. Yeah, intelligence, intelligence is knowledge about that which changes. And wisdom okay. is knowledge about that which doesn't change. Hmm. Folks, you need to re- stop, pause, rewind. There's a the little button in the, at least the, the podcast platform. Just hit that 15 seconds, go back, re-listen to that a couple times because sit with that for a minute. That's that's interesting. I not really thought of it that way. That's super cool. Yeah, I thought so too. I mean, it's, it's, it's been, it's been kind of crock-potting with me thinking that way through. I think it, it amplified what I thought of as it relates to wisdom. Wisdom's a funny thing, right? Because going back to what you talked about with agency and then we talked about control, I think it's related, right? Because if you're wise, you're you're not spending your energy towards things that you have no control over, right? That's not compatible with wisdom. Wise people pour pour their energy into those things that they actually can do, right? And they're not wasting a lot of time railing against that which they can't really affect. And then the other course, huge component there is what you're attending to. So what you're, what you're putting, putting your effort towards has higher effect if you're wise than if you're not wise, right? If you're not wise, you can be effective. You can be doing something that, and really good at it, but the net effect of it has all kinds of things that you probably wouldn't choose if you were <laughs> had a little bit more wisdom. So that's deep thoughts, right? I like that. That's super good. I so that's it's funny you say that. I'm asking, especially when we're sitting down for dinner or whatever with my family. I'm always asking for wisdom. So share me some wisdom. And the idea is that to have that thought, right? To get a thought that makes me contemplate kind of where I'm at in that moment of life, right? Where they're at, where I'm at. That way I can try to get a different perspective, is what I'm trying to find, a different perspective to challenge my own perspective to see what I am in control of or not in control of, which just kind of goes along with everything you've said so far. Uh, today, which I appreciate. That's super cool. So, well, the, yeah. the trick here, not to go too far down this road, but the, the trick here is, and where we get hung up is you mentioned sort of the 3D outer world. And a lot of people will use that, but they'll also throw in the fourth dimension of time. And time is, we, we get really screwed up as it relates to how we think of time. We, we know scientifically that time is not what we think it is. So we, we have the intellectual knowledge about what time, well, we're starting to get a glimpse of what, we, what time actually is um, compared to what it seemed like for, for, for the experience as long as there's been humanity. But, um, but it's interesting because if you think about the past, it's, it's just a memory, right? It's gone. There's nothing existing in the past. And the past is, is a story. And that story, as we learn in psychology, it doesn't have a, a huge correlation to what the actual reality was. Uh, I've heard it said that 50% of our, our memories are faulty, that are, that are distorted, and, and some people will say they're lies. That might be a little bit harsh, <laughs> but we should learn to not be so adamant about what we remember about the past. That's one of the things that we're starting to learn in psychology. And then as we look to the future, it's the same thing. It's a story. We have no ability to tell what the future is going to hold, what it's going to be. But we were just talking about AI. How many people have a lot of anxiety about, you know, the Terminator scenario or, or losing my job because of uh, automation or whatever it might be? And, and so, or these future sort of scenarios that may or may not come about, that's a story. It's not real. It's it, things good and bad are going to happen. Yes. Uh, But, but how much of our, you know, how much of that is real? It's, it's a story. And so what, what is reality then since the past and the future are, don't have that solidity that we we would think of when we use a word like reality, it's really what we're experiencing in the moment. Right. And, and that is, turns out to be multidimensional too. So, but, but, it's it's this cause and effect drama that gives us meaning so it's it's it, story becomes extremely extremely important in our lives and that's also where our agency and power is in terms of the stories that we accept 
and the stories that we tell. That, that's, a, that's one of the big um, tumbler clicks to get your agency is, is, is looking at and improving um, your stories. So is that part of the process with the eye of power as far as helping people pull out, discover what those stories are so they can be either rewritten or rescripted? I don't know what the right term or phrase should be, but is that, is that part of the process? Yes. That, I mean, I would say that that's exactly what you're doing as you look through the lens and you're saying, okay, I thought this was true, but looking through this lens, I didn't consider this thing. Now what? Now that I'm looking this way, now what am I going to do different, if anything? And so as we do that, we're actually changing our story. We're, we're accepting a little different element saying, oh, I thought I was the kind of person that was too afraid to try this. But you know what? I did this one little thing and it wasn't so bad. And I'm going to do the next thing. And now I have a new story. I am the kind of person that can already a little bit of discomfort in order to get the, the effect that I know is more important than that discomfort. Super cool. Yeah. So how important is, we're talking about AI, we're talking about a lot of great stuff here. So I'm just curious, the thought that's coming to my mind is how important or how valuable is the human connection going to be moving forward with all of this stuff going on, out the, the changes, right? The, the disruption that you're talking about and just the, the valuable ability to communicate, just like what we're doing right now. Being able to, de to decipher between something that's been created, I don't want to say fake, but anyways, it's just not by a human versus somebody, like I said, having a conversation, jumping on a podcast, having communication with somebody. How important do you think that that's going to be moving forward in the terms of business and even just in life in general? Well, there's a company in Germany right now that is creating um, AI coaches. So, so in other words, you could be like in the future or maybe even close to now. I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> the <laughs> future is coming could be, faster and faster all the time. It, right. It could be that you're talking to me thinking I'm a person, but I'm actually just a bunch of zeros and ones. I'm not an actual so flesh and blood person. At, now, in the reality, I, I am. The right? camera here. Is, Tom, is that you really? <laughs> it is me. Uh, but it's, it's good. You're, what you're pointing to, Randy, is absolutely uh, going, if not already, going to become more front and center of, of a thing like what does it mean to be a person? What does it mean to interact and connect? And um, that's that's going to be tricky. Best, I, I think about this a lot, and I've been thinking about it for decades. Best I can tell, it comes down to three things. I call them the three C's. Consciousness, creation, creativity, and connection. Hmm. Seems to me like those are the three fundamental things that define what gives things meaning purpose if you think about uh what it means to be made in god's image if we go to a, a religious place right what does it mean it, well it, it it means nothing without creation right there's either chaos or there's order right so order uh, creation is bringing order out of chaos consciousness is that which can see the difference right and and appreciate differences between chaos and, and order and then connection is that it's meaningless unless it's shared, unless it's something that, I mean, maybe ultimately, I'm not exactly sure how that works, but it's shared with some other consciousness. Is AI going to fulfill that connection piece for us? I don't know. We're testing that out right now. Um, my feeling is no. Uh, I, I think long term, no. Um, but it's going to be very obscured because people will be augmented and different too. So uh, it's, it's going to be very hard to predict what happens, but um, as it is right now, I think it's going to be a long time before we would say, I could just, I don't need any other person. I can just live with AI creations and be happy. I, I don't think that's anytime soon. And I agree with that based on what I've, the research I've done and just the thought process that I've done with myself. I agree with that too. Do you have, if somebody's out there listening today, that is like, they're, they're familiar with the term AI. Obviously they're, they're getting acclimated to it as much as they have been, or it could be up to this point. Any resources, any places you go to learn, try to get as much information as you possibly can. Is there anything out there that, that you'd be willing to share or did that you even I know would, of for people I to learn will. more? I don't think there's a better source than AI itself, honestly. I, I think if you mm -hmm. get on chat GPT or any of the, the big models that, you know, large language models that are out there and 
query and use it and ask about it. A- ask these qu- like we've been asking some pretty deep questions. See what Chat GPT has to say about it. You know, see um, and and be in that conversation there. That and, and then you can see how it's thinking. And it's not it's it's not perfect. And I've heard it said maybe twenty percent of what it'll spit out is not based in fact and reality. So uh, it, you know you can't take everything for the gospel truth or anything like that. It's it's just as fallible as the humans that have birthed it. But that's true with, with us having conversations too. We're just doing the best we know how. In the scope of what's true and real, we are still in the dark. I mean, we're, we, we know very small fragment of what reality actually is. And that's what's so wonderful about the connection side. And, and we, we can't see our own blind spots. We need each other. And that's what gives life its, its richness and beauty. The fact that you can see things I can't see. And if I can get out of my own damn way and listen to you and respect the person you are, I, I can be that much more alert, more enlightened, more awake because of that. And so um, that's the drive in the connection dimension. I love that. So yeah, I agree wholeheartedly. Just get on there and play with it. That's what I've done. The different, there's so many of new different tools, but just get on the basics. The chat GBT, uh, I use Gemini with Google's uh, Gemini. I love using that one. Um, yeah. Just play with it. Just see what you get out of it. It's interesting uh, what you'll get. So the input is as important, if not more important than the result that you get back. Right. So you get better at the prompts. I, I think that's what they're called, right? The prompts that you put yeah. in. You'll get better at that, and so it just takes practice to see to get the result that you're looking for. Requires a good, good, solid prompt, and that just comes with practice. That's been my experience. Yeah, and and prompt engineering is a field, and that field it's like a lot of what I learned in that course in terms of prompt engineering is is a little bit obsolete because what you used to have to do versus what you have to do now, it just in other words, anything that can be automated is being automated. So uh, the things that you'd have to figure out yourself. You don't have to anymore because it's it it like knows what you mean by that. Whereas in the past it didn't. So, but you still can play some games such as if when you ask a question, you can say, if you were the world's, if you were in a room with the top five experts in this field, right, and you give it a like a like a, a parameter to go from, um, it's that kind of thing. That, that's an example of prompt engineering, right, where you're. You're limiting what it is that it's going to think about. That still is a, a, a an effective approach. It's super cool. I, I love doing it. It's just fun to see what you actually get back out of it. Yeah. And I use it to help me a little bit with the podcast. So let's kind too. of pivot a little. Yeah. So let's pivot into that a little bit. Let's talk about the IF Power podcast. Tell us about sure. your podcast. Tell us about the message that you're trying to provide. Obviously, you've shared a ton of wisdom and, and some information with us here today with on the Rich Mind Podcast, which I greatly appreciate. That's my, my but pleasure. let's talk about, yeah, let's talk about the eye of power, kind of what you're doing. We mentioned that you just recently crossed over 100 episodes, which is a huge yeah. accomplishment. Congratulations on thank, that. Thank you so much. I appreciate yeah. it. And Tell uh, us a little bit more about that. It, it, yeah, I'll tell you, it goes fast too. I mean, uh, it's 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 been a labor of love, first of all. I started off the first, I'm going to say 70 some odd or 80 episodes were mainly just me talking. And what and and the the brand of the eye of power is really a, about our agency. So anything that either increases or decreases our agency was the focus of of any episode. So that which expands or or contracts our personal power that and that still is the brand to this day. But I learned to start doing what it is that we're doing right now is is interviewing other people in various pursuits and finding how they're expanding their power and, uh, and, or help how they help people do that or whatever it might be. Um, and I'm finding that to be extremely rewarding. So most of the episodes now are conversations like we're having now around the idea of agency and around the idea of how we might become more, uh, be, uh, what, what I say is, the, a more full expression of ourselves. That's, that's how I call it. It's not that you're a failure. It's not that you've missed anything or something wrong with you or you got character flaw. We're all flawed. There's no, you're going to be flawed till the day you die. So let's get over that. Um, but a, but a, a more fully expressed version of yourself. That's, that's the aim. So what's in there, let it, let it come out. Let it, don't let it be hampered and be held back by 
out, outdated or obsolete programming. So you mentioned right before you went in there talking about the podcast that you do use a little AI to help you with the production. I assume yeah. that's part of the process for yourself. Yeah, I do. I do the same thing. Yeah. I'm just curious. So the idea I thought that I had that maybe this, uh, this could be how we wrap this episode up was maybe sharing with some of the folks out there that are thinking, okay, I've got a message I want to share as well. I've got two guys on here that are well over the hundred or right at the hundred episode mark. They're, they've been pretty successful with their podcast. They're talking about using AI as a tool to help them bridge the gap from getting their message kind of crafted and out there in the uh, internet space, I guess, really. So how are you using the different tools out there to, to craft your eye of power podcast? There, there are three main ways that I've used AI for my podcast. One thing is I'll use it as a thinking partner. So if I have a topic that I'm thinking about, if I have something that I, that, that I want to talk about, I could be very detailed in my mind or it could be very sketchy. I'll, I'll go into a, a large language model. I use chat GPT 4.0 mostly um, because it, since I've had so many conversations with it, it knows the, it knows the eye of power. It knows it, how I think it knows exactly what I'm trying to say. It's great that way. And so if I want to do research on like, what do the experts say about this? It would take me hours maybe to, to, do the Googling and figure it out and read all the articles and all that. Whereas I can just say, Hey, what's the latest research? Give me five examples and links to them and boom, boom, boom. There they are. And, um, and then I might say, what's wrong with this? I might, I might test, uh, uh, like if I'm making an assertion, I might say, here's a, here's a theory, what's wrong with it. And so I can get the counter, uh, argument. So I can, I can, I call that an ecology check on, on what it is that I'm saying. So, th so you can, so it's a thought partner in that way and a research assistant. Um, so I find it very, very uh, helpful in that way. When I first started using it, I did an experiment. I, uh, part, I did, I did a podcast where some of it was what I wrote. And then I had the chat GPT do a whole bunch of it. And I just read that out. And then kept going, went back, and I wanted to see if the audience could tell the difference between what was me and what was the chat GPT output. Um, I, I, I did some of that, but I, I quickly got away from that. I, I wanted it to be more organic, my words. I didn't want it to be um, something that was generated from chat GPT. So that when I'm, and, I, and I'm, the number of episodes that I'm just doing with me just talking by myself is, is, more, is less frequent now. Um, but when I do do that, it's not going to be a lot of copy generated by chat GPT. So that's one. The other one is uh, another one is for episode art. So a lot of times it's hard to find a photograph or an image that, especially when you're talking about these esoteric things about, you know, the demons that we have to fight internally. Um, how does that look? And I find uh, like Dali or other types of image generators can do amazing things to come up with episode art. So that, that can be, I, I, I use that pretty frequently. Um, and I used to uh, actually get music, same thing. It, it's a splash I was using, but they went away. So I'm not sure if there's, I haven't done it for a while, but I used to use some of the music I would use in the episode would all be uh, generated by AI. Now I'm a musician. I could, generate it myself uh but it would take me you know two days to do a little snippet uh, for for one podcast and it's just i don't have the bandwidth for that so w rather than two days it'd take me 20 seconds or maybe four minutes or something you know very quick so um that can be very empowering as well yeah, it's super cool. So the yeah. ability, to, it's a tool, right? It's a tool that if you use it and learn it and not be afraid of it, it can totally multiply what you can get done in a relatively short period of time, which has been super cool for me. Uh, it's not that I don't need help producing and making and doing all of those things with the podcast or business and that type of thing. But at the same time, it's very... It's very user friendly. At least it has been for me. Like you said, it's gotten to know me as I've as I've inputted all the different things about me or the podcast, or whatever. It it just knows who I am. It knows my voice, which then can obviously even make it even more simpler when it's generating those different ideas and things for myself. Yeah, and I, and I just thought of another one, Randy, and that is uh, with with Photoshop or uh, what's the the it's uh, I never remember the name. It begins with a C. Ca uh, Canva. Uh, 
Canva, yes, Canva. They now have AI generating things that help you uh, with images. So when I have to manipulate an image or something like that, I'm not an artist. I, I'm not a graphic artist. I don't know that. But it's way easier now because it almost knows when you want to get rid of a background and you want to you manipulate an image or something like that. These things are getting to be so intuitive. They do it themselves. It's super fast and easy compared to what it used to be. And um, so that's another huge thing. So, so if you're talking about the visuals, the audio, the content, it can help you in any, any aspect. of, And even the production now, um, where if you wanted it to go in and take out ums and ahs and things like that, it can, I haven't done it that way, but probably could. It can. So we are currently using Riverside and actually within the back end of Riverside, once this gets recorded, there is a function that, that will take all of that out for you. There you go. Uh, yeah, it's an amazing thing. And that's where I told you before we hit record is the software has a few glitches in it and it's not perfect by any means, but at the same time for what you get for functionality, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Yeah, I get we'll more take out it. Of it. Yeah, I will for sure, especially <laughs> in the back end of production of the podcast. So hopefully you found that message as far as part of the, the episode valuable as well, folks. So we just encourage you to, if you've got a voice or if you have something you want to share with the world, it's never really been easier to get out here and just just try, just fumble through. It's like you said, I started off with a lot of solo episodes myself and you just get better. You get more comfortable yeah. sitting in front of the camera. You get more comfortable having the conversations with folks. It's just it's actually a lot of fun. You meet people from all over the world. We were talking about that as well. That's right. And you just make you just make those commu- uh, those connections that you never know where they can lead, but at the same time, it's just a lot of fun at the same time as well. So it's been absolutely super cool. yeah. It's it's it, get, that that meeting people from all over the world piece was a was an opted, um bonus that I, I'm going to say that's probably as as much as anything that that that's one of the things I cherish most about it. So. Me too. Me as well. Yeah. So as we start to bring this one in for a landing, Tom, I just, I just want to open up the floor to you. I don't know if I, I shared this as far as how I was going to end this with you, but I'm curious of what you come up with. But just a nugget of wisdom. We talked about wisdom in the conversation here today. Anything to share with the listener today, some inspiration, some some a nugget of wisdom. It can be anything. It could be just any thought that comes to mind right now. Uh, just something sure. to, to kind of leave the folks with. The one thing I'll say for anybody listening to me at this moment in time, what is the thing that if you could change, you would? And maybe it's something you've been trying to change and you haven't been able to. And all I'll say to that is, do you think that it's in your power? Do you think you possibly could? Is is it something you could possibly do differently? And my guess is it would be yes, because otherwise you wouldn't have the desire to make that change. And if you feel like you're stuck, if you feel like it's something you've struggled with, um, don't stay there. It, you don't have to. You don't. You don't have to be stuck. It's just a matter of of looking through the right lens, seeing that thing that's holding you back, making slight. They're not huge changes. They're slight changes. We we tend to be very much enamored of these big, glamorous, you know, huge. Mo- aha moments, light bulb moments or something like that. And that's not really what change is about. Change is about the tiny, small things, the 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 little tiny, you know, I, I ate one less bowl of ice cream that day. I want, I, I, I drank one less soda. I, I said hello to one more person on my way into the office. I, I smiled two more times that day. I listened intently twice more than I did other tiny little things like that. Over time, they make night and day difference. Love it. Mic drop right there. That's a great (laughs) way to end this one. So folks are out there like saying to themselves, okay, I need to get connected. We talked about connection in this episode, but I need to get connected with Tom and learn more about I Have Power. Maybe they're in charge of an organization or involved in an organization that needs kind of your wisdom to help them kind of bridge this gap of everything that's going on with what we've discussed today. What are the best places for people to connect and, and get uh, in communication with you? What's the best places for that? I, I don't hide. So it's Tom Dardick at I have is, is my email. My website is I have uh, You can find me on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, X, any of those things, Tom Dardick. And uh, I'll respond to anybody who reaches out to me. Sounds good, folks. I recommend that you get a hold of Tom. And he mentioned he's out there everywhere. So, you know, I imagine you probably just put in a little Google search of Tom Dardick and it would come up. I have power. 
We mentioned that several times. So Tom Dardick, I have power, and I highly recommend you get in communication with Tom. If you're in an organization or even if you know of somebody that could use some of the wisdom that we've shared here on this episode today, that would be a great resource. Uh, and you can always just uh, go to his podcast and start consuming some of his content, learn more about his message and what he's trying to provide as far as value out there in the marketplace. And you'll get a real, real close glimpse as far as what he's trying to do to help people move forward in this uh, moment. That's just going to be different, right? Don't know what's going to be like tomorrow. Uh, we mm -hmm. talked about the future and the past being kind of in our own illusion. We don't necessarily know, but it's like right now, how can we take control of today right now, this moment to Bridge that gap, right? Incremental steps. You mentioned that there at the very end. I love that. It's the small steps that we can do every single day that's going to, in a day, a week, five years, 10 years, that's going to be the difference that you're going to look back on and be like, wow, I can only imagine where I, I could be and I would be had I done certain things in a certain way. And hopefully you found what this message so far today has been valuable to you. So appreciate your time. Uh, go out there, find Tom. And uh, if you feel it in your heart to leave us a review on the podcast platform of your choice, I'd greatly appreciate that. Share the episode with your family and friends. Tom and I both are trying to share as much wisdom and things that we have learned and discovered with as many people as we possibly can. And for you to do that for mm -hmm. us, we would be much appreciated and uh, definitely be grateful moving forward. So go out there, have a fantastic day. I appreciate your time and attention today. And until I come back with the next episode and the next great interview, I look forward to talking to you very soon. Until then, bye now. Thank you for joining me on the Rich Mind Podcast. And remember, your external world is a reflection of what's going on inside of you. So focus every day on that internal battle and win within. Until next time, my friends. <laughs>